Welcome to Tech Empire. I'm your host, Michael Quet. Today, I'm excited to have on the show, Joe Fasler. Joe is a journalist and deputy editor of the news outlet, The Counter, and he's joining me to discuss growing meat in a lab. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Michael. Glad to be here. All right. So today we're going to be discussing an article Joe wrote called Lab Grown Meat is Supposed to Be Inevitable. The Science Tells a Different Story. The article argues that there's a lot of hype behind lab cultivated meat, and it takes a skeptical position that it will ever be cost efficient. We'll be covering everything you ever wanted to know about lab grown meat, what it is, how the industry behind it works, potential class and regional biases, and what the future may hold. Tech Empire is part of the Yale Podcast Network and can be found on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. On Twitter, visit Tech Empire Cast. My Twitter account is Michael underscore Quet, K W E T. And Joe's account is Joe Fassler, J O E F A S S L E R. All right, so let's uh, start this off. Uh, first of all, what is lab grown meat? Um, and this isn't new, apparently. Exactly. So the idea behind lab-grown meat is very simple, even if the technology itself is complicated. Uh, the basic idea is to take a biopsy from a living animal, uh, find a way to uh, immortalize those cells, um, which can be extracted harmlessly from an animal, um, so that they'll kind of reproduce endlessly, and then give them conditions in which the cells will do what cells like to do often, which is to divide and, and uh, reproduce. And so um, you start out with a small amount of cells and you end up with a lot of cells and you can do it in these big stainless steel containers called bioreactors. And the basic idea is, um, okay, let's, let's dispense with, you know, livestock and, and slaughtering animals. And instead we'll just grow these animal muscle and fat cells and eat those instead. And you mentioned that it's not new and, and that's true. I mean, that the idea is very radical and it's so different from the way humans have interacted obviously with animals for forever basically. Um, but in fact, the pharmaceutical industry has been using this technology for decades. Um, in van vaccine manufacture, for instance, or we've heard about because of COVID, we've heard about um, monoclonal antibodies. Um, when, when drug companies are developing those products, they often will use animal cell culture because the, uh, the, if it's the antibodies um, or if it's the you know, attenuated viruses they wanna put in a vaccine, those things like to grow among living animal cells. So the idea is let's grow the cells in these containers and then we'll actually get the product that we'll put into vials and sell to people. Um, this idea though has been going on for a long time. What's new about lab-grown meat is we'll actually eat the cells, um, which are actually a waste product in, in the, from the drug company's point of view. Okay. So I'm thinking here of what it looks like, because obviously if you're eating muscle from an animal, you're eating from a different part of the body, right? Um, whereas here, I mean, are you growing a thigh? Are you growing a breast of a chicken? Um, does it come out looking like one big block of meat, um, you know, kind of how does this lab grown meat unfold? Yeah. So for now, the, the main product that's being produced and, and let's remember, this is being produced at very, very teeny tiny scale, um, across the world right now. Uh, but the end result speaking generally is what's called a wet cell slurry. Um, and that is, uh, basically it's a, it's a, it's a amount of water and animal cells. And so it, it just is kind of a slurry, um, in the future, folks would of course like to be able to sell steaks and, uh, things that feel like cuts of meat, but the technology for that is even more, um, nascent and speculative, I would say. And, uh, and we'll probably also involve plants. I mean, one way that that's being talked about is to, to, is to take, um, you know, a plant scaffold, um, you know, some sort of material and, and sort of pump the, the slurry cells into that. Um, and then you'll get something like that is kind of formed like a steak, but, but yeah, uh, that's not really being 
done at, at any kind of scale right now, though there's a lot of experimentation and interest in, in it. And I think it's very likely that the first products we see will be ground products like burger, um, because that's what lends itself. That's what a cell slurry lends itself well to. It might also be blended products that that's probably even more likely the first products we'll see is um, a small amount of anim of animal cell slurry is blended with, you know, some sort of um, plant based protein, and you get something like a nugget that has a little bit of, you know, cultured animal meat in it. Yeah, so we'll get to that in a second. Because uh, I do believe that there are some things out there that you could buy as a consumer right now. Um, but before we ask that question, uh, and start going into what's happening in the real world with this. Um, how do we know this is safe to eat? Because for me, the first question that comes to mind is that's fake food. Um, you know, is it really something that is going to be good for me in the long run? It's an excellent question. I think the short answer is that um, no one really knows. Uh, there's no, there's no inherent reason that uh, that lab grown meat or cultivated meat would is inherently unsafe. Um, but there are issues that remain kind of unresolved. Um, and I can kind of talk through a few of them. So uh, one problem is that these cells don't have a rigid wall. And so um, the bioreactors are filled with cells, but they're also filled with what's called growth media. Um, and that is a sort of salty water that has a lot of, you know, proteins and hormones and nutrients and other good things in it that the cells like that induce them to grow. Um, and because the cells lack this rigid cell wall, uh, whatever's in the growth medium is going to end up in the cells. And that's where some of the potential um, safety issues come up. So um, these cells, you know, like us, like other living uh, mammals um, or animals need, need amino acids to survive. And uh, the amino acid supply chain, um, you know, some amino acids, for instance, are produced using E. coli. Um, and, it, you know, the E. coli is kind of ground up, but, but um, in the process, but it can put these endotoxins into the final product, which is fine when you're talking about using those amino acids as a supplement in animal feed um, or in certain applications. But for cell culture, it's really not okay because first of all, it might harm the cells um, and, and make them grow less quickly. But also if it ends up in the cells, it's gonna end up in us. And so that those kinds of issues really are a problem. And, um, you know, Right now, we're, we're you know in the U.S. we're trying to work out the regulatory um, food safety um, you know details of this stuff, and this is the kind of thing that's going to need to be considered. Um, the other thing, you know, this isn't quite about safety, but it does have to do with health. From what I understand, um, cultured meat doesn't have much of a nutritional profile. Um, you know, you're you're putting nutrients into the cells so that they grow, but ideally you want them to consume those nutrients and not have them be left over um, because then that's extra stuff in the bioreactor that is, you know, um, a waste of money or, you know, you want that, you, you just don't want that in there. You want them to be, you want to be using those nutrients efficiently. So from what I understand, to try to kind of match the nutritional profile of meat, those nutrients are going to have to be added after the, after the, after the fact, which is, um, Kind of begs the question of like, well, what's what's the point of this? You know, why not why not just eat those nutrients more directly if that's the case? Right. Yeah. Um, so the issue of or the um, we we're talking just now about this being available on the market. So obviously, um, uh, many people have, might have heard about um, in Singapore a company called Eat Just. Um, offers a chicken nugget meal for $23. And most of, so this is from one article. Most of meat says it will offer $10 patties by 2021. So this article is from October, 2020. And yet that same article says it costs $400 to $2,000 a kilogram. That's 2.2 pounds to make cultivated meat. So $23, $10, Four hundred to two thousand um, dollars. 
this seems confusing to me when you're reading it, right? Like what's going on here? Am I able to go in for 23 bucks and get my lab cultivated meat or what, if so, what, it's super expensive. It's still saying to make, um, it didn't seem to add up. And I know your article is really about this question. So let's use this as a launching point. Um, you know, kind of what's going on there with those price discrepancies and, you know, how commonplace is it that you can find this food on the market right now? Yeah. From, from what I understand, there is still only one, um, one approved place in the world where this is being sold in one instance from one company, and that's Eat Just in Singapore. So Eat Just has partnered uh, with a single restaurant in Singapore where their, um, their nuggets, their uh, cell-cultured um, chicken nuggets are being sold. And they also with a delivery company there. So there's some home delivery as well. And as far as I understand, that's the only place in the world right now where you can actually buy this though. I know, um, others are, are rapidly working toward that. And even this year, we may see, um, a few other approvals, uh, not in the U S but, um, I know in Israel, a couple of people are, are close. Um, I don't think Mosamid is doing it yet though. They, though they, um, uh, you know, predicted that they would or, or pledged that they would last year, as you mentioned. Um, and so, right. So it's very, very tiny amounts um, and, and just in one place for now. And so as far as the, the cost goes, um, yes, it's a great question. And as far as I know, you know, when my article was published, this was true. Um, Eat Just was selling those nuggets at a financial loss. So they were losing money on every, you know, bit of, cultured meat sold. Um, and the reason for that, I think is, well, they did get a lot of, I mean, I almost think of it as like a marketing cost. Like they got so much hype over this and some people really did get to try it. Um, and the news coverage they got and everything was probably worth the expense. Um, I also think, you know, these companies do need to answer to their investors. And so they can say, even if it's incremental progress, okay, we do have a product, people are eating it. They're the only company in the world that can say that right now. Um, but there's some pressure there. Um, and so that that's how though you make sense of this disconnect between the cost of production and the marketing cost. No one's going to go to market, you know, with a $400 hamburger. It just doesn't make sense. But what they might do is charge a normal price, hope that that can kind of win them um, some press coverage and some initial early adopter customers, and then figure it out from there, even though they'll be losing money, you know, hand, hand over fist when they do this. Yeah. And I, I know in your article that you eventually um, uh, spoke, I believe it was with the CEO. Um, and um, so your article was really, to me, fascinating. It's a, it's a long read and it's very in-depth and um, very well researched. And um, basically, uh, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the claim is that um, the ability to produce lab-grown meat, cultivated meat at scale seems like it may very well just be science fiction. And we're accustomed to thinking about technology and progress in society as something that just keeps advancing and, you know, without limits. So, you know, one day, you know, just give us enough time, we'll pull it off. And what the article um, seems to be saying is, yeah, but you have to really look at how this process works. And if you start actually looking how it, how it works, there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of promises, but there's a lot of limitations that actually may never be overcome. So in the first section, um, you have the, the biggest small factories in the world, and you start off in, in, in talking about um, a report and uh, actually two reports. One was by Good Food Institutes. It's a techno-economic analysis. And then there was one by... Um, um, open philanthropy, or, or um, it was a uh, Hill yeah. Hillburn. You can go through it, but um, that also seemed to contradict it. So, starting with this kind of big, biggest small factories in in the world, um, and those two reports, um, you know, can you explain a little bit about what was going on there? Yeah, exactly. So, part of what 
got me onto this is the Good Food Institute, as as you mentioned, they're a not a nonprofit ad, advocacy group um, that advocates for alternative proteins, so plant based stuff like the Impossible Burger, but also you know cultured meat companies. Um, they released a techno economic analysis, which is basically a fancy way of saying a prediction about what something's going to cost. And what they um, had uh, predicted was that cultured meat will reach price parity with some forms of commodity meat. So really, really cheap um, by 2030. So nine years from now, that report came out in March of this year. And I kind of thought, well, okay, huh, that's, that's, really fast. Um, and I started talking to people and uh, I talked to one scientist, a guy named Paul Wood, who worked for Pfizer for years, who had done his own kind of response to this um, and found that he thought that that prediction was was ludicrous um, for, for any number of reasons that, that we'll get it get into in a minute. Um, so then I started really digging around and I, and I found out that open philanthropy, which is another, um, you know, philanthropic organization, and in fact, funds GFI had done their own techno-economic analysis that they'd published in December of 2020, which said, this will never work. Um, it was done by a man named David Humbird, um, who basically is a due diligence scientist. Um, he, he works as a contractor a lot for the National Renew Renewable Energy Lab in um, in Colorado, which is like one of the federal sort of biggest federally funded research centers having to do with uh, renewable energy. And his job for them is to look at emerging technologies and figure out whether or not they actually have legs and whether or not there's something to invest in. And he found that for a number of reasons, um, he called it to me in our interview, a wall of no. Um, every angle through which he looked at this problem, he would just hit up against some sort of seemingly insurmountable limit. Um, and that was why one of the reasons I wanted to do the piece was, okay, so you have these two organizations, one is funding the other, and one is saying cultured meat is going to reach price parity in nine years. And the other is saying that no matter what you do, it will never be cheaper than like $18 a pound simply to just produce. That's not, that's not retail. Uh, that's not, you know, what you'd pay at a restaurant. Uh, that's not a consumer price. That's just the cost of production, which would mean like paying, you know, $40, $50 for ground meat. Um, and it will never go below that in his estimation. So what I was trying to do was make sense of these two conflicting reports. That would be what, $40 to $50 a pound? At retail, it could, yeah, $18 of production cost could could easily translate to, to $40 to $50 a pound, yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons... Uh, driving this uh, idea is um, that slaughtering animals um, is inhumane, right? Slaughtering them in mass is not a desirable thing to do. Um, and we know that there are some complications about shifting that off really quickly that is sometimes missed uh, because people in other parts of the world rely on that. Um, and it's not so easy to necessarily um, switch that off. But I think Ideally, a lot of people would say, um, you know, it's not really the most desirable thing to do, the most moral thing to do. We know that factory farming is often brutal on animals. And um, in addition, there's in environmental considerations. Um, and so you start off talking about, um, you know, how many calories you get out of, um, um, if, you know, for every calorie in uh, of input for to an animal, how much do you get out? And here I have, um, according to the open philanthropy report, a mature scaled up industry could eventually achieve a ratio of only three to four calories in for every calorie out compared to chickens 10 in steers 25. Um, so there are um, a desire for, or the idea is that there could be an efficiency gain here. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, that's basically what it comes down to is when you look at the rationale behind this stuff is one, to get away from slaughtering animals. Um, and that, you know, a lot of the people in the cultured meat sector are advocating for it um, are former animal rights, you know, world activist 
activism world type people. Although there's a lot of split feelings about this in the vegan community, uh, a lot of folks are really skeptical of it and think it's a distraction from some of the kind of you know traditional radical politics um, that have been associated with with animal rights activism. Um, but leaving that aside for now, um, yeah, it's it's basically like we're not going to slaughter animals. And we're also going to achieve these environmental benefits. And the environmental benefits are largely around this idea of needing less inputs to create a pound of meat. Um, you know, there, 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 there's a lot of environmental problems um, with, with meat production, obviously. Um, and uh, cultured meat doesn't necessarily address all of them. Um, for instance, cultured meat is going to be very, very energy intensive. In fact, this will create a sort of renewable energy grid and power the power the process through 100% renewable energy, it's possible that cultured meat could have a higher emission stent footprint, for instance, than some forms of traditional animal production. Um, but the idea is, yes, we'll use less feed, we'll grow less corn and soy, and then um, we'll you know, take that land that we're saving that doesn't have to be corn anymore and we'll, we'll rewild it or we'll do other things with it is, is kind of the proposition. Yeah. And so then you go on to say, well, but even at a projected cost of $450 million, one hypothetical cultured meat factory wouldn't come much cheaper than a traditional slaughterhouse, but it would produce a lot less meat. So Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in these factories. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was looking at the article, um, it almost reminds me of Brewing Bear, right? Where you have these vats and, and uh, they're big facilities, they're expensive. Um, and you say here um, about scale, um, to switch to cultivated meat by 2030, we better start now if cultured protein is going to even be even 10% of the world's meat supply by 2030, we will need 4,000 factories like the one uh, GFI that report um, envisions um, according to Food Navigator. So um, you're not saying that we should switch to cultivated, we start doing this now necessarily, of, of course, but you're saying if this theory was true, this then we'd, we'd have to be starting now, but we'd have to have 4,000 factories like this. So what are these um, factories like how does the process work? Why are they so big and, and expensive? Yeah, yeah. So, right. So a big reason when, you know, when, when I say earlier that my reporting found that, that, you know, the cost of cultured meat can't go below a certain, certain threshold, um, it, a lot of that has to do with capital costs. Um, in other words, build, the cost of building these facilities. And they're really expensive. That $450 million estimate is GFI's own projection. Um, a lot of people I talk to think it would be even more. And there's a lot of reasons they're so expensive. Um, these bioreactors um, are large, very pricey. They can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a piece, um, even millions if they're, if they're big enough and, and you might need you know, dozens or, or hundreds um, within a single facility um, just, to, just to do that. And and they're all custom, um, they're all custom products, right? I mean, every every uh, company is going to have its own process, uh, its own proprietary process. They're going to need these these manufacturers to build them this high grade pharmaceutical grade, likely um, you know custom uh, infrastructure, and it's just really expensive from that standpoint. But that's not that's really not all. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, one of the biggest challenges that, that I sort of found in reporting on this is the need for sterility. So um, animal cells and culture, they grow in, as I mentioned earlier, in, growth, in a growth medium. And that stuff is just like utterly enticing for viruses, bacteria, um, which would just love to get in this dense nutrient rich broth and multiply. Um, and you can't have that. Um, it's not even really so much about the, the human health risks of that as much as um, they, you know, bacteria, for instance, uh, just multiply so much faster than animal cells. So animal cells double um, about every 24 hours. 
um, you know, with a, with a bacteria, it can be, you know, every hour. And so at the end of 24 hours, what you have is an entire bioreactor, um, which could be, you know, 10 feet tall, um, filled with bacteria. Um, the animal cells will get, will get crushed or they won't be able to survive. And it's nothing that anyone could eat. So you really can't risk getting any bacteria or any virus particles um, anywhere in or around these, um, these bioreactors. And why that's challenging is because you essentially have to build what's called, it, again, what, what Humbert, who wrote the Open Philanthropy Report argues is that you have to do what pharmaceutical industry um, is already doing, which is build something called a clean room. And that's a, spe a specially designed uh, manufacturing area uh, that runs at positive pressure and can, you know, can, has a certain amount of air exchanges um, every hour so that particles that might be in there um, that are you know, pathogenic in any way are getting blown out, um, are not able to get in there. And I talked to one guy who's, who's worked you know, um, in a company where they were using fermentation, um, which is a similar kind of a process. And, um, and finding that you know, it gets down to if there's a certain tiny piece of welding on a single pipe that, that has a crack in it, that's enough to ruin your. That's enough to ruin your culture. I mean, these have to be air tight, and and the um, the risk is huge because if you fill a you know if you fill a two hundred a, a twenty cubic meter bioreactor with bacteria, you know that's hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you might have to take your plant apart to find out um, where the where the weak spot is that the germs are getting in. It can be really hard to find to tell. Um, so the, so sterility is paramount. And that the cost of doing that at the scale that you need is just vast. I mean, you know, with vaccine manufacturing, you can do this in a smallish room. If you want to talk about feeding the world with, you know, commodity priced cultured meat, you have to have huge facilities. Um, otherwise, it's always going to be expensive. I mean, why is like farm to table meat expensive? It's because it doesn't have the economies of scale, right? It's smaller facilities. Um, so in order for it to be cheap, it has to be big. And, and the way Humbert put it to me, he's like, listen, if you want to feed the world with this stuff, it has to be big facilities and it has to be clean facilities. And the cleanliness, the sterility requirements at larger size just become increasingly onerous and increasingly expensive. And it's just not possible. So it needs to be big and clean, but you can't do both. Right. Yeah. And um, I, when I was reading, that, I was like, okay, now this is starting to make sense as to why, cause you, you know, as an abstract thing, like you always just assume that, you know, we can do most things we put our minds to. Right. But um, making these facilities that big and keeping them completely sterile like that, uh, I mean, humans have limits, right? We're, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, all powerful um, creatures that can figure out how to just get things to, to work the way we want them to. And um, yeah, so like when I saw pictures in the article of people in um, lab jackets and things over their head, like masks, like they're in spacesuits almost, you know, working on these culture in these culture meat factories, that's not what I pictured. I pictured going into this that, that, you know, you're putting something in a Petri dish and you're watching it grow, you know, like you would in your high school biology lab, right? Yeah, and, and the industry has really, I think, um, advanced that comparison. You hear, you hear people talking a lot about, oh, it'll be just like brewing beer. You know what that's like. We have these stainless steel vessels and we, and we brew beer in it and it's right in the back of a restaurant. Um, some folks have even talked about it being like a bread maker where we're all going to have these, you know, these small little things on our countertop that'll, that'll grow our meat for us. And it's laughable, honestly, because, because of the sterility issues, you just, you just simply cannot do that. Like, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not going to work that way. It's not going to be, you know, this community hub where everyone's going around and, and checking them out. I mean, it's going to be, if, if it happens at all, it will be very, very closely guarded, biosecure, all this stuff just by necessity for the same reason that, you know, um, humans don't grow to be 500 feet tall, right? Like there are limits that come with biology. And when you're thinking about essentially making a huge synthetic animal, um, which is what these facilities really are, it can just only be so large before the biology itself starts to break down. Yeah, and that's something that a lot of people um, 
Actually, no, I remember learning about that. I think it was through Chomsky um, commenting on, you know, there's, there's limits actually to how large and uh, a biological organism can be. Yeah. Um, and I, I suppose how small too, right? So um, it's the same thing with growth in the economy too, when you think about it, right? Like you can only grow your economy so big and use so many you know, resources without messing things up. Um, so right, th- this is about almost like physical, biological, physical limits. Um, and, and again, you say in the, in the piece, a single speck of bacteria can shut down a plant, right? Like, okay, um, that's a problem. <laughs> One of the sections you have in the article is the price of synthetic blood. So you talk about um, fetal bovine serum in cultivated meat production. Uh, and as well as micronutrients and, and macronutrient, macronutrients. So what's going on with um, synthetic bl- blood and synthetic blood here? Yeah, so we just kind of went through like the capital cost aspect of this, um, you know, construction, buildings, sterility, equipment, all of that. The other big part of the cost is really um, the consumables, you know, the, the nutrients, the operating costs. And one of the biggies is exactly what you just mentioned. So um, in animal, as, as I said before, you know, these cells, in order to get them to, to grow outside of a body, um, they need to have nutrients and proteins and hormones delivered to them. And in our, in our bodies, what does that is, is blood, right? Um, it's got all this stuff, this, the cells are suffused in it and that helps them, um, survive. That's why, you know, if you cut off, if you cut off circulation to, you know, a finger or an appendage, it's why it starts to die, right? This, the cells need that. And the cells in culture are, are no different. And so, um, Fetal bovine serum uh, is something that the drug industry has always used, especially at the research and development scale, to to culture its cells in the lab. And it's great. It's great for cells. They love it. Um, What it is, you know, just to be clear, is it's blood that's extracted um, from the, the, the fetus. Um, of what would grow into being a calf. And, and the reason there's a supply of that stuff is because, um, you know, when dairy cattle are dairy, uh, dairy cattle are kept perpetually pregnant so that they can continue to produce meat. Um, and often when it's determined that they're at the end of their productive life, they're sent to the slaughterhouse. And sometimes um, they still will have, you know, a, a, an embryonic calf inside of them. Um, and it's discovered, you know, on the kill floor. And so um, at that point, um, the fetus will be euthanized, um, but it, its blood will be extracted because it's so uh, medically used, it's deemed to be so medically useful. There's, uh, it's not only that you can do animal cell culture with it, but you can, you know, all kinds of other, um, you know, medical treatments and stuff kind of stem from this stuff. And uh, so the idea is that for cell cultured meat products, which will largely, I think, appeal to, you know, vegans and conscientious eaters, at least at the beginning, it's sort of a non-starter to use fetal bovine serum to um, to grow this stuff in, in, in part just because of the optics of it, but also it's, it's, it's part of the, one of the more kind of brutal realities of the, of the slaughter supply chain. Um, and also it's just like really expensive and impractical. I mean, imagine if, if, if like we really needed, you know, to, to, to just like have a lot of fetal calves on hand to this stuff so we could feed the world with cultured meat. And the reality of that gets really messy really quickly. So one of the big challenges that these um, cultured meat companies face is to develop a new uh, serum that's plant-based. And it's um, it can be done. Uh, or it can be done at least on small scale. Um, but it's very expensive because you have to get... Um, amino acids and you have to get these growth hormones that are incredibly expensive by the gram um, and put them all into your broth. And so this is the challenge that they face right now. And, and um, you know, one of the big disagreements is, are these amino acids going to need to be, um, you know, chemically uh, determined and uh, pharmaceutical grade and all that stuff? Or, you know, can you just grind up some soy and, and give it to the give it to the culture because, you know, soy has actually a pretty complete amino acid profile in it and you could do that. Um, but, you know, one of the arguments I heard against that 
is that, well, first of all, if you do that, you don't know what you're getting. If, if it's just sort of feed grade soy, it could have all kinds of stuff in it. It could have virus particles in it. It could have pollutants. It could have heavy metals. That ends up in the cells. That ends up in you. That's not good. Um, you mentioned but, that um, with yeah. uh, somebody on Alibaba talking about getting, they gave a price quote, right? And yeah. it was it was soy from Alibaba. And the person said to you, I think it was like, dear, this is for, you know, fertilizing, uh, you know, whatever, plants or whatever it wasn't yeah. right like yeah it wasn't even really animal feed grade it was it was like just to put on plants to put on crops um and so yeah that was from so basically when gfi in its technonomic economic analysis was projecting the cost of what the amino acids might be um this was their source for it was this stuff on this protein powder on Alibaba that had who knows what in it, which you know would not likely be suitable for, for animal cells to grow in, um, but would also like have who knows what kind of health consequences. And the problem was once you start getting to like the dedicated amino acid supply chain and trying to get you know really pure, really high quality, really um, consistent versions of all of these amino acids, there's not enough amino acids on earth right now to supply a robust cultured meat industry. So if that was really gonna happen, you can't just scale cultured meat, you also have to scale amino acid production. And that just doubles the challenge there, right there, right? And you have to do it cheaply. So um, it's a real challenge that these companies face. There's one other aspect to it too, which is that um, you get your animal see free serum, it's working great, you know, at a, at a small sort of desktop scale, then you wanna scale up to your next bioreactor and you do it and it just doesn't perform as well in that size. And so you kind of can't know if your serum is gonna function at like production scale until you try it. And once you try it, if it doesn't work out then you kind of have to go back to the drawing board. So it's this, it's, this, it's this development cost that can potentially just ratchet up so quickly with no guarantee of success at any point um, along, the, along the process. Plus I believe you had mentioned that um... Uh, the soy production could be environmentally destructive. Am, am I right in remembering that correctly there? Well, 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 right. So this is this is one of the criticisms, which is that one of the most environmentally destructive things that we do is grow commodity corn and commodity soy. You know, we've taken native grasslands or in places like Brazil, um, they're clearing the rainforest to plant more soy for animal feed. And cultured meat doesn't actually wean us off of that. In order for cultural, cultured meat to make any kind of financial sense, we're gonna need glucose, which typically comes from commodity corn, and we're gonna need amino acids, which you know, if they're gonna be cheap ever, are likely gonna come from soy. And so we're going to just be repeating the folly of the past, which is that um, instead of just feeding ourselves more directly uh, you know, with say, vegetables um, or legumes or whatever, we're, we're, we're growing stuff to then feed animals. And it doesn't make sense. And so this would actually, this could actually really lock us into that by creating even more demand for that cheap commodity soy and corn. Um, and, you know, one of, one of the beauties of traditional animal agriculture is that there are a lot of, you know, certain grasslands, um, you know, places in New Zealand and Australia where nothing really grows there. They're not really suitable for crop production, but they are suitable for, for grass. And so it's almost like a freebie. You can, you can have the animals, they can live there um, and they can, you know, keep a somewhat natural environment, but sustain themselves off of it. You don't have to clear it and, and, and grow some other crop there than just to feed animals in a feedlot. Um, and so there's places where it the only kind of food production that makes sense is this form of animal production. Um, and so cultured meat, you know, would kind of shift us away from that towards an even greater reliance on the sort of monoculture, heavily uh, resource intensive commodity crop production that were that, that you know, environmentalists um, already kind of want us to pivot away from. Yeah, um, so we've taken a look at uh, quite a few um, dynamics here that, you know, really cast some serious doubt. And I believe um, the article you had said something along the line of like, kind of like just a lot of small no's, like each step along the way, you kind of look at it. Okay, you have the 
sanitation issue and, and keeping things clean. You have, um, you know, your your serum and your your culture to grow the meat in and issues with that. Kind of like every step along the way when you look at it, if you want to try to produce this at scale, you run into these not just like small problems, but they're really, really potentially catastrophic uh, problems. Nevertheless, there are a lot of folks, and it's kind of across the political spectrum. You have all the way from the, you know, the left, where you have, I think, very well-intentioned people who want to be good to animals and um, have a more sustainable world, who are pushing um, you know, you know, lab-grown meat, uh, Ezra Klein, um, you know, even at the kind of more radical left orient orientation, but then you also have, um, you know, some investors and, and things like that. This political landscape, um, how do you see, uh, I mean, what is the, the investment um, levels that we have now? And I mean, there are people who are calling for many billions of dollars to be invested in this, right? Uh, but it, it it seemed to me that it, it you know at least Biden you know it, there is not a huge investment on behalf of the U.S. government itself to subsidize it, right? Um, what is the um, how does it look in terms of money being spent on building this industry now? And what's what's the trajectory? Is it starting to pick up? Do you think it's going to uh, fall off because hype will set in? Um, what's the kind of money behind this uh, at the moment? Yeah. So there's been very roughly about a billion dollars in venture capital um, put, put into cell cultured meat. And, um, you know, certainly less than $50 million that I'm aware of, of sort of government money across the world um, put into it. And what seems to be very clear is that we're hitting the limits um, of what venture capital can do to actually scale this industry. Because we're not just talking about, um, you know, like I just mentioned with the amino acids, it's not just, okay, let's just, this technology works now, let's scale it. It's like, you have to scale other industries just to supply this industry. Um, but then the industry itself, the actual basic thing, just there's still so many scientific problems that haven't even been solved yet. Um, so we're just not we're just not there, and and in order for it to actually take hold and become something that's feeding a meaningful number of people, um, we're going to have to be not only like putting money. Governments are going to be have to not only be putting money into infrastructure, um, but also into research, and this is where this becomes kind of a judgment call and something that I can't answer. But it's 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 a debate and. Um, some folks will say, well, we need the government to, to spend this um, because if you do that, it's open source at least and everyone can benefit from this. And so the government's findings can be can be used instead of being this proprietary, you know, we don't know what these companies have, what, what, what breakthroughs they may or may not have done. Um, and so it's all hidden behind this veil of secrecy and that keeps the industry in, in, in a way um, from, from growing more quickly. Government research is open, it's transparent, the entire industry can, bear, can, can benefit from it and progress is made much more quickly. Um, so that would be good. But the, the counter argument to that though, is like, if this is being pitched to us as a climate solution, if that's the rationale, then do we really have time to be putting you know millions, if not billions of dollars into something that's still like, really highly speculative, you know, it, it really is. And, and at very least, it's going to take time. Um, and so the counter argument is just like, it's a public accountability thing. It's like, if the government starts to put serious money into this, well, if it doesn't work out, then that's, you know, that's like, public money that could have been used for any number of other things, including having to do with the climate. And with climate, you know, the, the choice is clear. We need to stop burning fossil fuels and we need, we know how to do that already. So, you know, do we, do we squander the limited resources we have and the limited amount of political capital we have um, trying to stump for cultured meat, or should we put everything into what the sort of central problem is, which is, which is fossil fuel use. That's right. I mean. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and to me, what comes to mind is, um, yeah, you have this this 
question of, well, why do we want lab grown meat anyways? Is it just because people like meat, right? Like, is it just that like people don't want to be vegetarian or vegan? So we want to just make sure they have something that's meat like to eat. Is that really a big part of what this comes down to? I think that's almost a hundred percent what it comes down to. I mean, to, to me, you know, what it, this whole idea comes out of a place of, of despair, I think, where it's like, okay, we can't use our political will to actually change culture. It's inevitable. Meat, you know, intake is rising. People are eating more meat, meat and there's nothing that can be done about that. Maybe that's true. I don't know. But, but this, this is a, a proposed solution that's saying, so because we can't do anything about that, the best we can do is, is trick people. Is, is, is substitute something else in that they will accept as meat, um, even if it's not. And um, I'm skeptical of that because, I mean, for all the kind of environmental and logistical reasons that, that we've talked about, but it also, it also means it's, it's a way of giving up. It's a way of saying that these, that these forces are, are inevitable um, when actually I, I do think that, you know, a lot of the activists that I talk to think, well, we're not just going to technologize our way out of these problems. Like it, it, the, the, ultimately the solutions are, are political, right? If we want to stop treating animals so brutally, if we want to stop exploiting people and workers and landscapes, then the price of meat will go up and we won't be able to have the same relationship to meat. Um, it's, and they feel that, that this whole idea is sort of kicking that can down the road. And if, if what you're doing is you're kind of avoiding the political, um, you're only going to replicate that. I mean, there's going to be labor issues in these plants. There's going to be economic issues in these plants. There's going to be ethical issues in these plants. And if we're deciding we can't have any of those conversations, if we can't deal with the corrupting power and influence of, of, of commerce, then, then we're kind of screwed from the get-go. Yeah, for sure. And, and um, you know, um, you had uh, mentioned something about possible class and in, in regional bias where you said, um, uh, quoting somebody in, in your article, these are not solution for uh, these people. And uh, I think that was people from, um, you know, some parts of the world. I don't know if it was exclusively Global South, um, but uh, so in this whole debate around the future of food, we're ending up with solutions that fit wealthy middle-class people who want more options. I got nothing against it, but don't pretend it's going to solve the world uh, food issues, you know, that's, that's the thing I find, uh, most offensive that was quoting somebody, uh, it might've been Wood or, or, or some other person. Yeah. That the, was Paul the article. Wood, the, yeah. the former Pfizer executive who had commissioned his yeah. own response to the GFI report and, and found it to be really, um, unrealistic and, and filled with wishful thinking. And, and, um, you know, he's someone who's, who's done a lot of work in the, in the global South. And, and basically what he's saying is this is a, in his view, this is this is a technology that's sort of designed to give middle class or wealthy people more options and have them feel good about themselves and feel good about their, um, you know, their choices and feel good about you know sidestepping some of the supply chain issues that they might be disturbed by. Um, but it's way too expensive um, to make sense in a lot of places in the world that wouldn't be able to subsidize it so generously or that wouldn't have you know huge amounts of like wealthy consumers ready to buy it. And, and it's also sort of culturally out of step. I mean, um, there are, like we talked about, you know, it's going to be ground meat. It, it's going to be nuggets, you know, it's going to be that kind of stuff in the beginning. And not everyone eats that, you know, a lot of places in the world when they eat animals, they, they, they're thinking of cuts of meat. They don't eat hamburgers, you know? Um, so there's this kind of top down thing where it's not really thinking about it's like, oh, everyone will just eat this instead, but it's not thinking about cuisines and 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 the way things work in that sense. Um, and a part of the, you know, that this that I didn't even get into in the article, but um, these animal cells are going to need to be genetically modified or, or transformed one way or another so that they're not um, what we typically think of when we think of animal cells. They're going to be 
highly distinguishable from the original biopsy from the animal. And I think that there's cultural issues there as well, too. I mean, that, that's not, I'm not just, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's a safety concern uh, necessarily or inherently, but um, there is a lot of cult cultural and political resistance to, uh, to GMO technology. And this is going to be really right bound up in that. And so that's another reason why, um, you know, especially in regions of the world that have had like longstanding political issues with the way that biotech companies have have kind of like come down and tried to legislate how people are going to produce their food. There's going to be issues there. Yeah. So I just want to ask you a, a couple more questions um, and uh, touch upon uh, just a couple more things. Uh, so this Eat Just uh, company that is operating in Singapore um, they produce, they currently produce hundreds, not millions, hundreds of pounds of meat per, per year. Um, and you spoke with the CEO and, um, one of the things you said is he was very candid and actually seemingly honest about the possibility of the limitations. So you did an interview with him, you brought up these issues to him, um, in that interview and he acknowledges that, um, look, man, like there may be, you know, serious limitations, but at the same time, he's uh, sitting there and saying within the next hundred years, he believes that this is still inevitable right now. Obviously, he's selling a product, um, but you do speak to the hype and the, and the shifting of goalposts um, starting to settle in. Um do you think that um, in a short amount of time, what are you seeing in terms of um, um, people's uh, opinions of this change? Did you get a lot of feedback from your article? And, you know, is there a spread now of kind of, um, you know, a skepticism about the viability of this? Yeah, I was very gratified that both, you know, in my reporting for the article and in my subsequent conversations, that uh, representatives from the cultured meat industry um, said the story really got it right and that the challenges described in the article are real and are not yet resolvable. Um, so that was great. I also heard from people, you know, who told me um, off the record, you know, after the piece came out that there's a lot of people in the, in the industry who themselves are actually skeptical about it at this point. Um, and their, their goal isn't even necessarily to to produce a, a, a huge, you know, kind of killer app product, but to just get bought out um, or to have an IPO or, so, or something and kind of, you know, back away. Um, and so I, I think that that is, it's, 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 it's the state of the industry. I mean, one, um, the CEO of a company called Val Foods, right, wrote a big long thing um, saying, you know, I agree with this piece that might sound crazy, but yes, this is where we are. Um, of course, then he pivoted to optimism, which is the other side of this, which is like the, the move among the industry seems to be a yes, but it's like, yep, these problems are real and we are facing them and they're really scary um, and, you know, forbidding, but the, um, the end goal is just so noble and important that we, we have to keep going and we're optimistic, you know, that we will one day get there, um, whether that's through, you know, advances in science, through government funding, or through their own private, you know, adventures in this, um, they're going to get there. And it's an, it's an inevitability argument, you know, it's that like the march of progress will continue. And it may, or it may not. Um, you know, I, I heard other people say that they, you know, others have told me, even from within the industry, um, folks have told me, you know, since the piece came out that they think it's going to collapse, the industry is going to collapse. Um, so we'll see. I think the thing for consumers to watch for is a, a shift in language, because when this first started coming out and there first started being articles around 2015, it was like, okay, you know, the writing's on the wall. Um, this is going to be the next big thing. You know, it's coming for the meat industry. Tyson and other meat companies are investing in this stuff by the way they do that so that they can just, um, Oh, so if those companies have to open up the books, they know what's going on. Um, it's a kind of bets hedging, I think, for 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 companies, and that they can it's, and sort of the due diligence thing. But it's not a sign that they think it's a viable product. Um, so I think you're going to start to see the goals are going to get less and less, 
you know, uh, ambitious and radical and, and the achievements are going to become kind of more and more humble um, to the point that, you know, the comp some of the companies now, they, they, they want to open a tasting room, you know, they want to do some small things here and there and just hope that, uh, that they can sell enough on a small scale to kind of gain a foothold and figure it out. But right now, no one's really figured it out and, and no one knows how they're going to get to even in 100 years. Um, that place where this is the dominant, you know, form of protein that we eat. Yeah. And so maybe last question here, um, you work on, uh, food politics, food science and tech. Um, I'm going to have, um, Max Isle on, he wrote a book called the people's green new deal, and he is sympathetic to, um, you know, um, treating the animals well and all those things, I, I believe. Um, but he also has written that uh, uh, a lot of people in the global south, they, they graze cattle, they, they rely upon um, fishing and, and things like that. And you can't, you can't just switch these things off. Um, obviously, we have, uh, you know, for, for them, you know, like you need a plan and a phasing out if you're ever going to go in this direction um, so that everybody's livelihoods are taken care of. Um, and so my question to you is, um, what do you think about the, what we should be doing to be ethical, environmentally sustainable, um, to, you know, we have the impossible burger, um, right? Like it's, it's plant-based. Um, should we be trying to go in that direction? Um, you know, from a global perspective too, taking into account, like, everybody across the world. Um, what do you think that we should be doing with our, uh, with meat and, and, and the food systems that we have? So, yeah, I mean, it is clear we, we do need to eat less meat and we need to eat less meat, especially um, the way that America grows it in a way that like, you know, Western companies have sort of exported um, all throughout the world. And, and we shouldn't forget that, right? That this, that this problem of, of uh, this environmentally unsustainable, brutal approach to meat production is really something that, you know, that we invented and exported um, and destabilized often, um, you know, directly or indi indirectly functioning ecosystems and, and, and food systems, food ways um, along the way. And so, you know, I don't know that we should necessarily um, lay the blame, you know, anywhere else except for looking at, you know, for instance, American food policy and American exports policy for a lot of this stuff. Um, but we do need to eat less meat. And, and um, especially, you know, this, this conventional meat. And, and again, I would argue that the way to get there is not by, you know, technologizing our way out of it by making uh, it more efficient, whether that's through, you know, increasingly efficient animals or increasingly, um, or cell cultured meat or any of that. I mean, there's this, there's this idea that, you know, economists talk about is like, if you make something more efficient, people just do more of it, right? It, 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 it doesn't, right. or, you know, or then you have more people, right? Because, and, and it just, it kind of crashes down at some point. Um, you know, efficiency is not in its, in and of itself, um, a long-term path to sustainability. And so I think what is a longer term path in sustainability? And that is really talking more about exploitation, you know, and that that's talking about the exploitation of animals. That's talking about the exploitation of workers and of landscapes. Um, that's talking about the exploitation of powerful uh, private interests of, of policy. Um, all of these things, if we could address those things, our relationship to meat eating, both here and globally, um, would really change. And, and I think we're, by, by thinking solely through the lens of technology, we're avoiding some of those really difficult questions. And I would say the last part of it is like, yes, a lot of the people in proponent who, who, who do propose these things, they, they talk about um, their goal is ending suffering, right? Um, but you should talk about who's suffering because I think the people, I think people suffer too. And while a fish does, you know, theoretically suffer um, when you eat it, or certainly, you know, you know, mammals and uh, will suffer um, if they're slaughtered for meat. Um, 
There's also a form of suffering that comes from not being able to sort of determine your own, your own course, you know, to not being able to feed yourself. And when you look at, you know, indigenous uh, landscapes and cultures where, where, you know, it's, it's, it's very direct, you know, the path from, from the stream or, or to the, you know, or from the, from the land to the mouth. Um, there may be the suffering of the animal, but there's, there's the joy of feeding oneself. And I think that these colonialist uh, top-down approaches to food production um, often do dislocate people from their own history and from their own traditions and from their own ability to achieve food sovereignty and, you know, to feed themselves. And, and that's its own form of, I think, deeply and acutely painful suffering um, that we should also take into uh, account when we're talking about saving the world. Yeah, for sure. And I, I couldn't agree more. The colonialism question uh, is popping up more uh, in, in conversations today, and it needs to be grappled with because a lot of our the ills in our societies today really do stem from colonialism and the mindset and outcomes of it. Um, so yeah, um, this is great. Uh, I, I love the article. Again, it's lab grown meat is supposed to be inevitable. The science tells a different story. It's at the counter. It's a, uh, the counter is a nonprofit news outlet. And it, the article is by our guest today, Joe Fazler. Thank you, Joe, for coming on the show. He can be found on, on Twitter at Joe Fazler, J-O-E-F-A-S-S-L-E-R. And I suggest people um, check out the counter. Uh, Joe, thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Michael. Fun to talk. All right. Take care.